Hello and welcome back. We're doing part two of Lindy Page's video about the Czech legions. I know this is a very niche topic about World War One, but I enjoy learning about these new things. I would have never known about the Czech legions if it wasn't for this video and for Logan who suggested it. But since we've already done a part one, that means you guys have left a lot of comments answering my questions that I had in that video. So we're going to take a quick look at those comments. All right, so what I did is I went into the comments of my video and I just highlighted some of the ones that I want to touch on really quickly. Volvillian said, oh wow, I've had a fascination with the Czech Legion for about 20 years. Great reaction. Appreciate it, Volvillian. I thought that was really interesting since this is such a niche topic. Somebody has a fascination for it. Then we of Andrew Clayton, he says he, as in Lindy Beige, mentions the reenactment video where he talks about his experiences of trudging through the snow for several days. That video is very instructive too. Perhaps you'd like to follow up on it later. I actually had that thought when I was watching that little uh, snippet of the video. I kind of find reenactments pretty interesting. Uh, Blame Thand, who is an old school viewer of the channel, he also says, <laughs> glad to see me back. The ultimate origins of the red versus white thing is the French Revolution. I was not expecting that. White was the color of the Bourbon monarchy, so signifies right-wing reaction and loyalty to the old regime. The red flag was originally raised by royal troops to signify no quarter, we will kill you, <laughs> rather than accept your surrender to revolutionaries. But after the revolutionaries won, they adopted the red flag as their own symbol and altered its meaning to mean the blood of the martyrs. By the time of the Russian Revolution, the revolutionary flag was a mostly associated Okay, it kind of just trails out right there. <laughs> I didn't, didn't realize that. I think what he's gonna say is the red flag was mostly associated with like communists. But I appreciate the background on that. Domix, Damix, uh, Pafarta? I don't know if that's how you say that. Says that this channel has become quite a history class for him or her. Thank you for the interesting content. Thank you for watching. It's always more fun to learn history with other people. Kind of one of the reasons I started this channel. Scrumpy says the Battle of Hastings was the first major bust up between William and Harold in 10 1066. So yeah, Hastings was mentioned by uh, Lindy Beige. If that's true between William and Harold, I, I didn't know that there was a William and Harold back in the day in 1066. Are the current William and Harry named after them? And that's kind of strange, isn't it? That um, there would be trouble between the two of them back then and then we have what's going on today. Uh, Michael Lavoie says the Reds and Whites refer to the Red Army and the White Army, the two largest factions in the Russian Civil War. Reds fought for more extreme Bolshevik style of socialism. The moderate Mensheviks having split from them some years earlier. Whites were basically monarchists who supported the Tsar, though they also contained different and sometimes hostile factions. So yeah, basically what I'm getting is Reds revolutionaries, Whites Marcus. Alistair, good one. Good to see you again in the comments. Lindy Beige is way beyond most of us. <laughs> there were a few comments there were people in, you know, watching the video were like, um, yeah, that was hard to follow. You do have to pay very, very close attention to what he's saying. If you kind of like zone out, then you kind of, you get lost. It does take a bit more effort, I feel like, to watch his videos, but you still learn. Marvin TP Android. <laughs> It's an interesting name. Eastern European history isn't taught as much in the UK as it should be because it tells you a lot about Europe now. I don't know what you mean by uh, because it tells you a lot about Europe now, but I did I, I did wonder about that. Like, do you guys learn more about it over in Europe since it's part of your continent? Oliver Sherman, good to see you again as well. Hey, so gal, when's your next Patreon movie night? I do a Patreon movie night over on Patreon. We, we watch um, movies together as a live stream, so I have people in the chat you know, chatting with me during the movie. If it's a lot of fun, if you're interested in checking that out, um, we have several movies in the backlog you can go back and watch. I think what we're going to do, not necessarily a movie, but it's one that has been requested quite a bit, and it's The Christmas Carol Goes Wrong, and we're going to live stream that probably on Saturday, and I'll be announcing that pretty shortly here. Flora Tosothan. The Reds and Whites were the two sides of the Russian Civil War. That was one of the bloodiest wars, civil wars in history with about 2 million dead soldiers and further 9 million civilians. You know what's nuts to me? It seems like there are always these like huge, huge death counts with Russia. <laughs> I mean, they had the biggest in World War II. This is insane, the amount of people that died in their civil war. What I don't really understand is, is the Russian civil war the same thing as the revolution? For some reason, I'm seeing like the civil war took place after the revolutions. Is that right? So I'm not real clear on that. All right, so 
that's gonna do it for your comments. Really appreciate you leaving them. I do learn a ton from you guys in the comments. That's the whole point of why I'm doing this on YouTube is so that I can learn kind of more interactively with you. I learn so much more that way than if I was just watching this stuff by myself. With that, or we'll dive into part two of Lenny Beige's talk on the Czech Legions. I'm gonna go back just a few seconds, but we were at the point where we were at a train station incident. The reds and the whites are trying to disarm the Czechs. The Czechs don't like that for obvious reasons. This leads to a train station incident. So let's see what takes place now. They're on their way to, the Czechs are on their way to France, I believe, because they want to kind of like defect to France, even though France is still on the same side. Uh, they don't really feel safe in Russia because of the revolution going on. Obviously they're being disarmed. So they're trying to get to the West where they feel like they'll be um, safer, I guess. I have no idea how this plays out. It'll be interesting to see. So let's see what uh, Lindy Beige has to say about it. Plenty of problems to deal with. Um, anyway, some of the Czechs were able to escape through Archangel, but quickly it became obvious that this was not a practical prospect. So. Um, what else could you do? Well, um, the, the Reds and the Central Powers were united in that both of them wanted these Czechs disarmed and would, whenever the Czechs went to try to go somewhere, they would go to a railway station, can we get on a train and go over there? Ah, uh, yes, just leave your, your, your weapons there in a pile and they were having to hand in more and more and more of their weapons. They were, they were allowed to keep fewer and fewer and every time they'd gone, gone down to the number of weapons they were supposedly allowed to keep, then the rules would change at the next place and could you hand in more of your rifles? And, and every time, of course, they do this, they feel less safe, more vulnerable, less trusted. Leonardo less trusting. DiCaprio again. <laughs> Um, and this came to a head at the, see if I can get this right, che Chelyabinsk. Chelyabinsk? I think it's called Chelyabinsk. Anyway, the, there. Uh, the Chelyabinsk railway station incident. It makes me feel better that Lindy Beige, who seems to be a scholar on a lot of this stuff, has trouble pronouncing words sometimes. <laughs> now. Uh, there had been quite a few railway incidents. Um, for instance, there are a number of tales I've read where trains that were going along the tracks uh, on parallel uh, lines like that, just passing each other, would exchange small arms fire as they went past. Uh, because one lot would dis assume that the other train was full of undesirable types. Well, at Chelyabinsk, uh, the story goes, and you can never with these sort of uh, stories take them uh, at face value. You've got to imagine that no one really knows exactly what happened. I'm sure an awful lot of he said, I said, and, and twisted words come into it. But anyway, um, the story goes that there was a train load of Austro-Hungarian troops and a train load of Czech troops at the station. And one of the Austro-Hungarians, who in some versions of the tale was ironically actually of Czech uh, origin, he threw something. In some versions it's a stone, sometimes a shard of metal, sometimes a bayonet. He threw a thing and supposedly this hit one of the Czechs in the head, injuring him very badly and in retaliation some Czechs shot him. And then the local authorities turned up, arrested the Czechs and threw them into prison. And uh, this was, if you like, the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, the Czechs thought, right, that's it. Um, there is no rule of law here. No one's on our side and no one is going to get those uh, guys out of prison for doing what, frankly, you know, they should have done. We were just defending ourselves. We're trying to move on. If we all leave now, those guys will be left by. Right, let's get what rifles uh, we've got together and let's go and rescue them. Come on, let's do this. Let's take matters into our own hands. Let's take the law into our hand, own hands. We cannot uh, anymore um, kowtow to the supposed authorities. Who are these authorities anyway? I mean, everywhere we go, the authorities are a different lot and they all claim to be the ones in control and that we should obey their laws, but they keep making up the law. Right, let's just do this. So they took up arms and they rescued their fellows. And this was reported to uh, the high command of the, of the Bolsheviks as a full scale revolt, which it wasn't really. But as I say, it was, if you like, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the moment when the Czechs thought, right, we're on our own now. Kind of reminds me of like the Wild West like when you go spring people out of jail, like the gang comes and posse, whatever, <laughs> comes and springs their person out of jail. And uh, a few uh, days later, they overwhelmed the garrison at uh, Penza uh, and were able to recapture almost all the arms that they'd handed in. So they're now a big armed unit in this sea of chaos around them. So what should they do? Well, um, the, the, the Czech uh, legions, uh, I 
I have used the word legions a few times. Actually, during World War uh, One, they were almost never referred to as the legions. Uh, they were the brothers. They were the the. They had a number of um, other types. The, the term legion uh, came into being right at the end of World War One and was used um, thereafter. But anyway, uh, these these Czech soldiers, it's ex-Russian army Czech soldiers. What did they do? Well, they were a democracy. And uh, so they, they had some meetings and, and took votes. Now, they could try again to get to Archangel. That was one option. Uh, they could perhaps just stay where they are. Uh, they could um, hand in their arms, give up and say, Where's where's Archangel again? <laughs> I either missed that or forgot. I don't know. Okay, yeah, we will uh, play nicely with all the various authorities. They could try to get back to their homeland. And of course, for some of them, they'd never ever been to their homeland before because they were born in Russia. But uh, they could try to get back to Bohemia but there's an awful lot of war in the way. Not only are there war, uh, is there war that we've got to go through here with all the whites and the reds fighting each other and the reds fighting the reds and the whites fighting the whites, but there are also uh, those uh, Germans and Austro-Hungarians. -Hungar and uh, as soon as um, the, the, uh, the proposed Czechoslovakia came into existence, uh, Poland and Hungary were immediately fighting border wars to try to change those uh, agreed on borders. World War One is a mess. Holy cow. I thought it was bad on the Western Front for what I've seen of it so far, but this is like way worse. Yeah, it is chaos. I would get out of there too. Uh, so there was a huge amount of war between where they were and where they needed to get to. So they thought, we're never going to make it. You can't walk through three wars saying, excuse me, do you mind if I just walk through I know wars? We're, we're trying, I know they're on your side. Could you just let us through? Just be nice. Uh, no, that wasn't going to happen. Um, so they voted to do something pretty extraordinary. They voted to go to Vladivostok and get a ship and from there head east, get to the uh, west coast of the USA, go across the USA, get another ship and go to Europe. Yeah, they voted to go all the way around right. the world to get home that way. Now, Vladivostok, it's quite, no, it's not quite a long way away. If I were to say that uh, Vladivostok is, is quite a long way away, that would really be lying to you, frankly. It's, it's that inaccurate. Um, okay. And let's, let's have a look at the map. Okay, so here's, here's, here's Paris. Perhaps you know that is in France. Then there's and so you've got the Western Front, and you've got uh, there's Berlin there. Let's keep going, and uh, there's St. Petersburg. Okay, Moscow. There's Archangel up there. Oh, uh, so there is. Port. Okay, he was about to tell me what it is. There's St. Petersburg. Okay, Moscow. There's Archangel up there. Uh, so that was the port, and Vladivostok is there. Yeah, it's all. all right, so Archangel, why are they trying to get to Archangel? What? is a port. I know he probably talked about this in part one, but I don't don't recall it. So what what is there that they want to get to? Is there, I, I don't know. Talk is there. Yeah, way it's up there. all the way, 6,000 miles away <laughs> through the frozen wastes of Siberia. It's, it's up and right a bit of North Korea. It's just about as far away as it was possible for anywhere to be that you could conceivably get to on foot. And they thought, our best chance of getting out of here is to go there. Um, the Czechs have just voted to go to Vladivostok. Vladi flipping Vlostok. It's just Vostok. It's just so far away, it beggars the imagination. So in order to get there, uh, the practical way would be to get control of 6,000 miles of Trans-Siberian Railway. Unfortunately, at a time when quite a few other people, what with there being a civil war and everything, uh, are also quite keen to lay their mitts on that same uh, railway. But the, the Czechs had a bit of an advantage because uh, they got off the mark a bit quicker than a lot of people because they already were an organised army with a command structure and uh, internal communications and the like. And they were dealing with an opposition that was quite fractured. Uh, the whites hadn't got it together, the reds hadn't got it together. Um, so they were able to get off the mark fairly quickly and capture a load of trains, including six armored trains um, fairly early on. So that, that was uh, one advantage they had. Okay, this is going in a completely different direction. <laughs> that I thought it was going to. Oh my gosh. This is actually a really cool story. I had no idea. I was really expecting them to, to go to France via the Western route somehow. I was not expecting a round the world journey. And then they, in order to, to get to get on that journey, they have to uh, do a lot of like really cool like James Bond stuff here going on. It's crazy. I wasn't sure where he was going to go with this at the, you know, part one. This is turning out better than I thought. Um, 
I just mentioned just the general amount of chaos around them was one of the biggest advantages they had. Throughout the entire journey, all 6,000 miles, they were substantially outnumbered by enemy forces, uh, several, several to one, pretty, yeah, pretty much the whole time. Um, and uh, for one stage of the journey, they had... Wait, there is, so there are enemy forces in like Siberia? Why? Like I would figure that it would be pretty much just like wasteland with maybe a few tiny towns or something. I wasn't expecting like there to be fighting in that part of Russia, but I don't know a lot about it, so. I had to get through tunnels, really, really long tunnels through mountains. And uh, that was a, a significant campaign. You might think, how the hell do you fight your way through a tunnel? Well, w with great difficulty, but one way is, is you try to get control of the mountain above the tunnel. And yes, their enemies did try to blow the tunnels and they did bring the ceiling down, but never completely and permanently closing the tunnels off. Uh, it took weeks sometimes of digging to get through the rock, but they were able oh to get through the rock and to secure these tunnels. Now, uh, when they made the decision to go to Vladivostok, uh, they were not all in, in one lump at that point. They were, they were scattered in pockets. Um, and oh, I should say um, Chelyabinsk is one of the cities on the, the Trans-Siberian Railway. And they took possession of several cities uh, along, the, along the railway. So this was a not insignificant military operation. They had to control a huge amount of, of land and hang on to it. Um, as a war went both ways across them because the whites actually got together and the whites um, started doing quite well against the reds and of course the whites were constantly saying you should fight for us you should fight for us against these awful bolsheviks you hate the bolsheviks don't you go on fight for us and some of them joined in but um, most of them just thought no you're a load of you're a load of weirdos and you're a load of out for yourselves warlords are all fighting each other all the time and we can't trust you um, Okay, I forgot that there was a civil war going on. I was just, I was thinking about World War One. Actually, I don't even know. What, where are we in history right now? <laughs> what year is this that he's talking about? Is this during World War One? but also there's the Russian Revolution, the Russian Revolution going on at the same time. So there's infighting in Russia plus World War One going on at the same time. So it's all happening at, at, at once. Is that kind of what's what's going on? But if there is that civil war going on at this time, that makes a little bit more sense why there would be more fighting more in the Siberian part of Russia because it would probably engulf most of the country, I would imagine. And I know that there are cities in Siberia, but I just, I feel like they're really scattered around, you know? But holy cow, digging through tunnels for 130 miles, having to take towns and mountains, it's like, this is, wasn't expecting any of this. And I've said that multiple times already, but this is like, Truly blowing my mind. <laughs> I mean, these guys are like super soldiers or something here. And then after a bit, the uh, the white advance stalled, and the reds countered and started pushing the whites back. At which point, the whites were extra keen to have the use of the railway because it would have helped them quite a lot in their retreat. But unfortunately, the uh, the Czechs decided that no, actually, if it's all right with you, we'd like to hang on to it. We went to quite a bit of effort to get it. Um, uh, one thing that made it uh, a lot easier to get ahead was that in a daring raid, they managed to capture, and what a story, this is on its own, they managed to capture almost the entire Russian Imperial Gold Reserve. Yeah, quite a bargaining chip. Uh, but it was a bargaining chip that they did end up needing. Um, now, another bargaining chip they had was the leader of the Whites, a chap called Admiral Kolchak. Now, he was, well, he actually abdicated. He was the leader of White Russia for a while when the, the Whites were about as unified as they ever got. Um, but he saw that the game was up and he abdicated as ruler on, on board a train and he was handed over to the Czechs for, for safekeeping. And you can see how that was perhaps an astute move because um, uh, for a lot of uh, people to be given him as, as, a, as a hostage, as a prisoner, would have been quite a poison chalice. But the Czechs, they could at least be trusted not to shoot him, right? Um, but as the, the Czechs moved to the east, they came across uh, opposition from a comparatively moderate uh, regime of uh, socialists who said, oh, yes, hand him over to us. He'll be a prisoner. He'll be given a trial. It'll all be fine. Hand him over to us or we won't let you pass. So what do you do? You are tens of thousands of people. You've got loads of civilians traveling with you. You've got wounded. Uh, you've got an awfully long way to go. You could fight your way through, in which case, how many people are going to die? Die for this one guy. Wait, so there are civilians with them? When did that happen? Like, thought that they were just a military legion or whatever. Didn't realize there were civilians traveling with them. Who are these civilians? Are they just people they picked up along the way? Or he probably, he, already, he probably said something about it earlier in the video. Or you could hand him over. 
or you could give up. Well, what are you going to do? Well, what they did was they handed him over. And I suppose you can guess what happened. A load of much, um, much keener uh, Reds, uh, they came along and said, oh, we'll have him, thank you very much, and they killed him. And of course, from that point onwards, the reputation of the Czechs uh, was stained. Uh, and a lot of the whites said, you were traitors, you, you betrayed him. And well, yeah, they did, but he was one guy and there were an awful lot of them. And uh, it's an imponderable, isn't it? What should they have done? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend that I know, uh, but I do know that it's, uh, it would have been a pretty horrible decision to have to make. And with that massive amount of gold bullion, they were able to bribe their way east. And uh, yes, they did eventually get to uh, Vladivostok. In the end, they, they managed to control 6,000 miles of, uh, of railway. And uh, they managed to capture 259 trains, which is an impressive achievement, I would say. Um, and they did this under most appalling conditions. It's Siberia. In winter, the, the temperatures drop down to minus 30, quite commonly. Um, loads of them lost fingers and toes and ears and noses to frostbite, particularly in January 1919, which oh was especially gosh. bitter. So these columns are... Wait, what did he... Down to minus 40 Fahrenheit. Okay. Minus 20 centigrade is the norm in the winter there, but it could go down to minus 40 Fahrenheit slash centigrade. Why is it slash centigrade? I thought centigrade was different than Fahrenheit. In January 1919, which was especially bitter. So these columns of bedraggled people had to make their way against overwhelming odds over a vast, a, a vast distance. But astoundingly, they actually managed to do it and they were able to get ships from the Allies that came to... Uh, came to Vladivostok and took them away and uh, in all 67,730 of them made it back uh, of which 11,271 were civilians but unfortunately 4,112 of them were in graves left behind although you know out of 70-ish thousand people um, 4,000 dead I, I, it, it's, it's a pretty uh, I, I find it amazing that there were actually so few of them who died if you consider uh, how many of them could have died. Uh, there are a number of what-if scenarios. Okay, so there's 70,000. That's probably including the civilians that are with them, but I thought it was more like, I don't know why I thought this, five or 6,000. <laughs> that was way off. Uh, one of them is that when they were surrounded by chaos and the, the Eastern Front had collapsed and there were no uh, really well-organized forces in Russia, they were actually in quite a strong position. At that one moment, they could have, if they'd voted differently, they could have perhaps marched on Moscow, some have, uh, have uh, suggested, and they could have taken Moscow, and then perhaps they could have dictated terms on, and uh, set up their own little rule within Moscow and then negotiated with various other powers. Who knows what could have happened? It's one of those amazing what-if uh, scenarios. But anyway, they didn't. They decided that they'd had quite enough of this mad, uh, mad Russian politics and they just wanted to go home. They wanted to go home to this new place. And of course, by the time they got there, um, two years later, there was a Czechoslovakia. And when they got there, they found that it was a liberal democracy, which I imagine that uh, pleased most of them. Um, and that uh, they were welcomed as, as, as heroes there. And uh, for a while, uh, everything, well, um, not everything, there, there's still lots of troubles. I mean, one trouble, for instance, was that they were immediately involved, with, as I mentioned before, with the border disputes with, with Hungary and, and Poland and other neighboring uh, countries. But they actually did pretty well in those, in those uh, uh, border wars and were able to preserve um, their, their country. And uh, in 1939, of course, things changed because you perhaps do know what happens in 1939 is that Czechoslovakia gets annexed by Germany and becomes part of the Axis powers in World War II. Um, and uh, this, this nation, which uh, people like the British and French had hoped would be big enough to defend itself in the end, was, even though it was large and had quite, a, quite an impressive uh, military force. The, 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 the tanks of the Czechoslo Czechoslovakian army in 1939 were a pretty formidable force. Unfortunately, they all ended up getting used by the Germans against the Allies, including the Russians, of course. Um, uh, they did end up being just a political pawn and they got annexed without a shot, with, with hardly a shot fired. Uh, I say hardly a shot, uh, actually 13,000 of the Czech legionaries did actually 
uh, die either fighting the Nazis or in concentra concentration camps having been imprisoned by the Nazis. Others of them escaped to places like uh, England and uh, then joined Allied armies and uh, fought against the Germans that way. Uh, but unfortunately, of course, they didn't get their homeland back at the end of World War II because Czechoslovakia was liberated not by the Western Allies but by the Soviets and so it fell in under the Soviet sphere and uh, that was uh, definitely the, the worst of the two po possibilities. Uh, there was a, a, a false hope in uh, uh, 1968 when there was the Prague Spring, but that was crushed. And uh, the people of Czechoslovakia had to wait until 19, no, ni yeah, 1989 uh, for the Berlin Wall to come down to get their freedom from Soviet oppression. And uh, things moved pretty quickly after that. In 1993, uh, the two countries of Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, split apart and created their two new nation states. It, by 1999, they joined NATO. And the very last of the, 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 the Czech legionaries of World War I had had a head of a life. He died in 2003 aged 107, and what a life he'd had. Just think about wow. what a life he'd had. He'd seen his nation born, then he'd seen it annexed and come under the sphere of one tyranny, uh, then it got, uh, then there was World War II, and then it came in under, oh, well, first he, he fought World War I, uh, then there was World War II, uh, and then it fell under another Soviet domination. And if you were one of the uh, Czech legionaries, under the Nazis and Soviets both, you were not treated well because uh, the Nazis and the, the Soviets, they did not see you as, as a hero, uh, one of, your, one of the, the, the people who, who fought for the, the founding of your, of your nation. Uh, they were, a lot of them were, were jailed, uh, dismissed from jobs, um, and, uh, they, yeah. uh, and their story was suppressed. They were not allowed publicly to talk about this, this heroic tale. Um, but anyway, and uh, so that uh, last legionary who died in 2003, as I say, uh, he got to see the full circle. He got to see his nation come right the way back to a modern liberal democracy again. So I think you'll agree. It's quite a tale. That's scary. <laughs> okay, so impressively throughout the long march to Vladivostok. They managed to keep a postal service and newspapers running. So that last guy that he was talking about that lived 107 years, died in 2003, he must have had one heck of a stressful life. I can't imagine. I mean, you're just living in constant instability. It's just crazy to think about. But now I want to like learn more about the Czech Legion because it's just a really sounds really fascinating. Like when you break it down into the different things that they did. I mean, they just they just seem like some of the toughest soldiers in history. I don't know. So they would be interesting to learn more about. Now I understand Baldvillian when you said you had a fascination with them for 20 years. I think I can understand why now. So that might have to be a thing that we do. We might have to learn more about that. Even though I know I'm probably not going to get a ton of views on the Czech Legion. You know, it's kind of an obscure topic. But those of us that would be interested in learning about it, we'll watch it. I also wonder, um, are there stories about the Czech Legion being here in the US? Because he said that they would go through the US, through Western Europe to get back to Czech Slovakia. So I'm just curious about that. Like, are there there are stories about them? Would they did they go through the U.S. like mainland, or did they just sail around it? Not sure what route they took. Probably would be like closer to like Alaska going down. So they probably wouldn't. I don't know. Can you go through the waters of Canada? Oh, like he didn't talk about their their journey. I'm gonna have to have to kind of look into that. But if you guys can let me know down in the comments. I would appreciate that. Also appreciate you guys watching. As always, Roger and I both do. If you have any more suggestions about what videos would be good to follow up on with the Czech Legion, let me know down in the comments as well. Stay tuned for more history videos coming up and we'll see you next time.